Hello, Isaac here. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. So, in the next few videos, I'm going to be providing an overview of Larry Hurtado's book, Destroyer of the Gods, while also adding my own commentary, thoughts, and considerations along the way. So, please do remember to like, comment, and subscribe to keep track of all the future content. Now, for those that don't know, Larry Hurtado was a formidable New Testament scholar and historian of early Christianity who wrote some significant books on Jewish monotheism and early Christian devotion to Jesus. He sadly died in 2019, but in 2016 he wrote this small but incredibly illuminating book, Destroyer of the Gods, which sought to outline several defining features of early Christianity that were unique and quite simply odd in the ancient Roman world, but which have subsequently become, in the modern Western world at least, unquestioned assumptions about religion itself, which has made them almost invisible to us. So, briefly, these four defining and unique features that he focuses on are firstly, Christianity's exclusive character since it insisted that only the one god of the biblical tradition should be worshipped, secondly its inclusive character since it was trans-ethnic and provided a religious identity that was separate from a person's ethnic or national identity, thirdly its bookish character as a sacred text had a central place in both corporate and private worship and because unrivaled energy was put into copying and disseminating texts, which also had distinguishing physical and visual features. And fourthly, its ethical character, as unlike ancient Roman religion, it placed a unique emphasis on social and behavioral practices, which often departed from both tolerated and approved Roman practices, such as abortion and the exposure of children the spectorial and gladiatorial games, sex and marriage, and the practice of paedophilia. But before we get there, Larry Hurtado lays the groundwork for this study by tracing the growth of Christianity with its different varieties, as well as the responses to the movement from pagan and Jews in the first centuries. This will provide a basis for understanding Christianity within its Greco-Roman context and it'll help us to understand its distinctive character. So, let's begin. So, within a couple of years after Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection and exaltation, as his believers believed at least, the Christian movement spread to Damascus and Antioch in ancient Syria and within a decade or two to several cities in present-day Turkey and Greece as well as Rome and other places such as Alexandria in Egypt. And although the initial movement was only made up of Jews, it quickly expanded to include non-Jews or Gentile converts. Despite this initial growth, the movement was sometimes met with violent opposition and criticism. For example, James Zebedee, one of Jesus' close followers, is executed by Herod Agrippa, the Jewish ruler of Judea around 42 AD. And James, Jesus' brother, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, is also executed at the behest of the Jewish high priest Ananias in 62 AD. We also find that during Nero's reign, adherents in Rome were specifically targeted and put to death in various hideous means in the aftermath of the fire of Rome, which Nero blamed on this new movement. It is believed that the Apostle Paul, who was in prison in Rome at this time, was beheaded in the wave of this persecution, and that likewise it is believed that Peter, an important leader of the early church, was crucified in Rome during this time too. Nonetheless, despite the occasional and imperially sponsored efforts against the movement in spasms of violent suppression, especially under the Emperor Decius in 250 AD, who inaugurated the first emperor empire-wide persecution of Christians, the movement grew at a remarkable speed. 
and it's simply the case that no other cult in the Empire grew at anything like the same speed, as Larry Hurtado writes, tracing its growth. To take a set of estimates now often cited by scholars, there may have been 1,000 Christians in 40 AD, about 7 to 10,000 by 100 AD, about 200,000 or a bit more by 200 AD, and by 300 AD perhaps 5 or 6 million. Rodney Stark in his book Triumph of Christianity has pointed out however that there was nothing especially miraculous or unprecedented about this growth. Although the numbers may seem quite stark to us, showing that from AD 40 to 350 it grew at around 3.4% per year every year for its first 300 years. In comparison, Christianity is currently growing at 1.2% per year today, but certain groups such as Pentecostalism grew by 5.4% per year from 1970 to 2014. But still, it is important to know that Christianity grew in its first three centuries without state backing and during spasms of violent suppression. As Lehari Hurtado writes, the growth of Christianity in its first three centuries, the most crucial period, was largely by a combination of the power of persuasion, whether in preaching, intellectual arguments, miracles exhibiting the power of Jesus' name, and simply the moral suasion of Christian behavior, including martyrdom. Granted, however, the adoption of Christianity as a state religion of regimes produced thereafter a more ambiguous story in which Christian leaders sometimes used imperial authority coercively against other religious groups. Therefore, Christianity in the first few centuries was popular, although it had sometimes deadly consequences for its adherents and lacked any state backing. One of the reasons at least why it may have been attractive to converts as well as why it may have been seen as a threat to the Roman state power was its distinctiveness within the Roman world. Larry Hurtado, drawing on Rodney Stark's observations on why very few religious movements succeed, argues that a successful movement must retain a certain level of continuity within its cultural setting, and yet must maintain a medium level of tension. As Larry Hurtado writes, that is, a movement must avoid being seen as completely alien or incomprehensible, but on the other hand, it must also have what I mean by distinctives, distinguishing features that set it apart in its cultural setting, including the behavioral demands made upon its converts. There has to be a clear difference between being an insider to the group and an outsider. Therefore, Christianity is not entirely unique or foreign, but is distinctive within their own world. And it's important to understand that these distinctives contributed to its success and growth, arguably then as it has now. For example, classic liberal forms of Christianity, which have been concerned to align themselves with dominant culture, have declined massively in the West. Meanwhile, the churches which are growing most hold to more orthodox views, which are often out of step with dominant culture. But we move now on to the varieties within the early Christian movement. Larry Hurtado points out that in discussing what made Christian distinctive within their own world, the question arises, which Christianity? given that there were different groups from what has been termed the proto-Orthodox, which has often been regarded as the precursor to the more familiar Christianity of later centuries. These different groups that we know of are the Valentinian Christians, Marcionite Christians, as well as the Gnostic Christians. For example, Valentinians believed that the God of the Old Testament was an imperfect creator, of the material world and that Christ's role was not primarily as a sacrificial savior, but as a spiritual guide that provided the insights, the gnosis or knowledge that allowed individuals to achieve liberation from the material world and union with the divine. 
On the other hand, Marcionite Christians believed that there were two cosmic deities, the benevolent Demiurge or Creator God, identified with the Hebrew God of the Old Testament, and the benevolent God of the Gospel who sent Jesus Christ into the world as a saviour. Christ's sacrifice then was a legalistic act that cancelled the claim of the Creator God upon humanity so that he could save humanity and bring about a new home. But in any case, the focus of Larry Hurtado is what scholars have termed proto-Orthodox, as they were simply more successful at winning adherents in the earliest period, and ancient critics seem to have taken proto-Orthodox or Catholic Christianity as their object of concern and scorn, which suggests at least that these other groups are not as important, as Larry Hurtado writes. In the social rough and tumble of religious rivalries of the first two or three centuries, these proto-Orthodox or Catholic Christians seem to have won out, and well before Constantine and the subsequent influence of the state in matters of religion. That is, the proto-Orthodox or Catholic Christians were simply more successful at winning adherents in that earliest period, and their success did not depend then upon state support. Therefore, the proto-Orthodox group, from whom we have received the books of the New Testament itself, were simply more popular, and that will be the focus of the study. Next then, Larry Hurtado will summarise some of the responses to this Jesus movement from both Jews and pagans in the first three centuries. That Christianity was different in the context of the Roman world is evident in how outside observers, both Jewish and pagan, viewed this early Christian beliefs and practices as different, odd and even objectionable. In terms of the early Jewish response, we find references in the Acts of the Apostles to Jewish opposition in Jerusalem as well as other cities. In fact, Paul's letters give us a first-hand reference to his own actions against the Jesus movement before his conversion. Besides this, Josephus recounts the execution of a leading figure in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem church, James, Jesus' brother, by the Jewish high priest Ananias. Larry Hurtado puts this opposition down to the claims about and reverence for the person of Christ. As he writes, I submit that Jewish Christian claims about and reverence for Jesus were deemed highly objectionable and likely comprised at least a contributing basis for opposition from at least some in the larger Jewish population of the day. In terms of the pagan writers, Christians are often seen as dissonant and out of step with larger Roman culture. Tacitus, for example, described how Nero blamed the fire of Rome in 64 AD to deflect accusations against himself on the Christians. And Tacitus himself referred to Christians as hated for their abominations and promoting a deadly or dangerous superstition. Likewise, Suetonius very briefly refers to the punishment meted out to Christians as a class of people given to a new and wicked superstition. In their use of the term superstitio in Latin to describe Christianity, they are suggesting that it has religious beliefs and practices that they deem to be excessive, repellent and monstrous. Pliny, an imperial legate to Bithynia and Pontius about 110 AD, wrote a letter to the Emperor Trajan about a people denounced to him as Christians. He reports his actions against those accused and how he gave them three opportunities to denounce their faith and if they refused, he either ordered their execution or, if they were a Roman citizen, sent them to Rome for further trial. These three opportunities or tests for the so-called Christians was for them to recite a prayer to the gods make a supplication to the image of the emperor with incense and wine, and to curse Christ. 
There is here no indication of criminal action by the Christians, but instead they were judged for holding a perverse and extravagant superstition. How might we then understand this attitude towards Christians? Larry Tardo believes that the problem is their exclusive worship of the one God of the biblical tradition. As he writes, it seems to me quite plausible that the social and economic effects of Christian withdrawal from the worship of the gods, or simply the fear of such effects, may have been at least one of the causes for the denunciation of Christians to Pliny and likely to other local officials. This issue can in fact be found from earliest times and arises in the Acts of the Apostles. In, chapters, in chapter 19, 21 to 40, artisans engaged in making miniature shrines for the goddess Artemis in Ephesus start a major disturbance in reaction to the preaching of Paul, fearing that their livelihood would be endangered if people were to convert to this new religion en masse and stop showing reverence towards the Greco-Roman gods. In the second century though, the pagan critique of Christianity would become more serious and articulate with figures such as Galen, Marcus Aurelius, Seleucian, Porphyry and Celsus, which would in turn birth an intellectual Christian apologetic from individuals such as Origen, Tertullian, Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria and the author of the Epistle of Dionysius. The pagan critic Celsus, for example, in his book The True Word, offered a comprehensive critique of Christianity and had clearly acquainted himself with both the Old Testament and early Christian writings. For example, he touches on topics such as the divinity of Jesus, the historicity of his life and resurrection, Christian morality and contradictions in scripture and the question of miracles and prophecy. But the scale of this critique at least demonstrates the threat Christianity posed due to its numerical growth and upward creak through societal levels. For Celsus at least, as with earlier critics, the problem is the abandonment of traditional Greco-Roman gods, which amounted to sedition against the political and social order, as Larry Hurtado writes. Despite all the alleged stupidities of Christians, Celsus expressed a willingness to tolerate them if only they would honour the gods and follow the polytheistic customs that everyone else, excepting of course Jews, affirmed. By their refusal to do so, Celsus contended Christianity's question the validity of the gods upon which the social and political order rested and were guilty of impiety and, at least implicitly, of promoting sedition. If the masses of people followed the Christians in their madness, Celsus declared this would provoke the wrath of the gods and the social and political order would fall into anarchy and chaos. Therefore, one of Christianity's defining features for Larry Hurtado was its exclusive character, since it insisted that only the one god of the biblical tradition should be worshipped over and against the wider Roman era piety of reverencing all the gods. The Jesus movement shared a traditional Jewish exclusivity in refusing what they regarded as idolatry, but still more offensively, they believed that everyone else should refuse to worship the traditional gods and worship only the one god of the biblical tradition. To understand how strange and radical this was, one must understand the religious character of the early Christian empire, which was, as Larry Hurtado notes, a world full of gods. This we shall explore in the next video. But as we shall see, it wasn't just a religiously exclusive. Christianity was distinctive for being ethnically inclusive. So I look forward to seeing you next time. And please do remember to like, comment and subscribe. I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.